Welcome to Stories of Hope. I'm Christine Hotchkiss. Each week, I bring you stories that will educate you, inspire you, and of course, give you hope. In honor of Veterans Day this week, we have a guest who's going to talk about and is a veteran. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge a couple of my sponsors for today's show. One is my studio sponsor, The Motivated Mind Group, that is a global creative agency located here in downtown Chandler. And the sponsors for today's episode are the Chandler Business Alliance, Building the Bridge Between Business and the Nonprofit Community. And then there's Cruise Planners, who help you see the world before you leave the world. I've always wanted to say that because we hear them every week say it. And I'm like, I got to do this. I got to do this. So thank you to my sponsors today and for this episode. Today, Susan Whitaker is going to share with us what it's like to be a female veteran, and she served 20 years in the United States Army. Please help me welcome my guest today, Susan Whitaker. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, so Good to be here. we hear a lot about men in the military, but I very rarely get to talk to someone that's a female who's a veteran as well as in the military. So you get to educate myself and others what it's like to be in the military. But first I need to know, what inspired you to want to be in the Army? Well, I was kind of thinking that um, on my way here. Um, uh, I don't really, I, I, the only thing that I can say is um, when I was younger, I, I used to say that I watched too many movies, John Wayne movies. I wanted <laughs> to be a, a nurse in the Army. I didn't become a nurse, but I, I, I did join the Army. Um, in career day during school and during high school and stuff like that, I would always go to um, the military, whether it be Army, Navy, Air Force, and just listen to what they had to say. Um, it, it, just, it just inspired me that, you know, it, it was just something that I thought, hey, I, I would like to do that. Um, I guess, and I'll also work, uh, my father was in the Army. Um, that probably helped a little, but um, just, I don't know, just that. I had a girlfriend that actually, she is the one that um, joined the Army before I did. Um, I joined right after, I, I got out of high school, then I went to a couple years of college, and then I joined the Army. Um, but the friend that I had, she joined the Army first, and so she took me to her recruiter. So that's really... And it, it, it's a little history it, of it and, think, and some yeah, inspir inspiration I, I, from a friend. Yeah, I think if she would have been in the Navy, I would have been Navy. If she would have went to You'd the have been um, that too. Air Force, that too. Well, I know there's a rivalry amongst them all, but I'm going to say no matter what branch that you're in, I thank you all for doing that. Whatever it is that was the reason that you did it and why you stated it. And for our veterans, most definitely I appreciate you sacrificing not just your personal life, but your life. And there's a lot that's a sacrifice I don't think a lot of people realize. It is. You're right. I, I, it, when you join the Army, especially if you're married, well, then, you know, it's, it's everybody's, you know, in the military type thing because it does demand a lot of things in regards to your time. But, but obviously, I, when I was in the military, um, and that was a while ago, um, but, um, yeah, it was... Uh, it, it, it was a growing period for me. Oh, personal growth? Yes. Okay. I mean, it was um, born and raised in Arizona. Mm -hmm. So that was my first time away from home. Oh. Um, took me to um, South Carolina initially, um, where I went to basic training. And, and my, all my training was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So I was going from the West Coast to the East Coast. So I experienced that. Um, and then my first duty assignment was Germany. Okay. So... That was another, wow, here I am, um, away from home, um, and um, just kind of thrown in. But it, it, it was also, I, I compare it to someone going away to college. I did four years active duty, and I, I compare it to somebody going to college for four years. Although I had a roof over my head, and I had a job. So I had that, um, you know, security but it just took me and exposed me to so many things. So. And from what I understand now, I'm a um, daughter of a Marine, but I didn't live the lifestyle because things changed in my growing up. 
So I didn't actually live it to understand it. That's all I can claim is I was born at Camp Pendleton. Yeah. <laughs> um, and education was one of the incentives for people to enlist. So I don't know if it's the same as it was then, it is perhaps now. Um, so I don't know what you actually did in the time that you served. Well, uh, like I said, I, my, I, my, my thought beginning was, you know, to be a nurse, but for whatever reason, when I was with a recruiter, um, I, I got into the administrative field. So I was more, my first job, or my, what they call the MOS, or your military occupation specialty, um, is, was personnel. So um, with that, I did medical, or I did um, personnel records. And so um, you needed someone like that everywhere. So we, there was an opportunity that you could go anywhere. Um, but so my whole career field was basically administration. Um, but you could go to different units, which had a different mission, but um, mine was um, pretty much personnel. So we handled, um, you know, pay uh, uh, in my uh, unit, would handle pay, personnel records, things like that. So, so there's a couple of things that I um, am aware of. Um, when you said where it takes you, well, we also know in that 20 years there were a couple of wars, one of them being Desert Storm. I'm very familiar with when that came about, as well as the Iraqi Freedom War. Correct. Tell me a little bit more about being a part of that. Well, I joined the Army, was active duty for four years, and then I got out of the Army um, but stayed in the reserves. So the majority of my 20 years plus is been with the reserves. But, and the mission that my reserve units had um, was always stateside. But we did get deployed for both um, Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. So I was living in, um, at the time, um, I was actually living in South Carolina because I had married and he was in the Air Force and we were at Shaw Air Force Base. And so my reserve unit was um, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But we got deployed. Our deployment was just Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And our mission was to, as reservists or National Guard were getting called up individually, well, then they would come to what our unit, and we would make sure they had all their equipment, training, and stuff like that. So we, that was our, our take on, the, on um, Desert Storm, because units would go, would get called up, and I'm talking reserve units or National Guard units would get called up and they would have personnel shortage or they would have equipment shortage. And so they would come to Fort Jackson, Carol uh, South Carolina um, for a certain amount of time for them to get fully, get all the um, pers personnel shortages, any kind of equipment, any kind of training they, they needed before they were deployed so they could hit the ground running. So you were actually in both of these places? I did. I never deployed overseas, but yes. And then, and then when Iraqi freedom, I um, um, we by then my husband had retired out of the. Um, he was in the Air Force, um, so we were back in Arizona, and so the unit that I had was actually once again um, was at Fort Bliss, Texas, and we were called a garrison support unit. So when Iraqi freedom, uh, or yeah, Iraqi freedom hit, well then, um, then a lot of the active duty units were gone, so we came and we ran Fort Bliss. And once again, the reserves units would come there, they would need, and this was a whole unit. The first, the first um, we did individuals, the unit that I happened to be at that time, we unit would come there once again. They would, get, we'd give them training, make sure they were trained. Um, um, the real thing, you know, we would do convoys and things like that, that type of training. Um, and then also, um, once again, if they had personnel shortages or they needed, you know, will and wills, you know, all everything that they needed, you know, to to make sure that when they um, were in country, they could they knew everybody back home was okay. Oh, good. And then the communication. Um, correct, and they okay. can and they could um, move forward, do their job, and stuff like that. So that was that was. I say we had our own little wars back in you know, at Fort Bliss, Texas, because you know it was you know trying to get at that time we were pulling. I know everybody remembers the story that they had 
MP units that, you know, didn't have uh, their, their vehicles were, you know, they were getting shot at, but they didn't have uh, the... Uh, personnel to be occupied. The personnel or, or the equipment, you sure, know. Sure. So um, that was the, you know, everybody was, you know, we were, you know, it, it was just, we need the equipment, you know. A lot of moving parts, and you were able to do that, which brings me to something else that I'm aware of that you told me, and that was being given the highest rank an E9. So those of us who don't know what E9 is and those of that you do out there, please share. Well, I was lucky enough. Um, I was at the right place at the right time. Um, so I did, um, before I retired, well, then I did made um, and was able to make um, E9 command, uh, Sergeant Major. It's Sergeant Major and also Command Sergeant Major. I was also lucky enough to be selected to at, at a unit where I was pinned on with the command sergeant major. So I was, I made um, E9. E9 is the highest ranking you can make as, as, as an enlisted soldier. Um, so you have your officers and then you have your enlisted and I was able to um, make E9. So what are those responsibilities being an E9? Well, um, as, as far as the E9, um, like I said, it's the highest and b with being a command sergeant major, um, you are the command team, so you have your commander, which um, is the officer in charge. Obviously, he makes, but the command sergeant major is is the advisor to the commander for all the enlisted um, issues that they may have. So you're the you're the mom, or you're the you know uh, of everybody kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, I guess mom or dad of everybody, but as far as the enlisted side, so. So I'm not sure if this is really going to have an answer, but um, I'm going to ask the question anyways. <laughs> what was the most difficult part, if there is one, or the scariest part, being a part of any of this, whether it was the wars, um, being put in a position you weren't familiar with from the very beginning, just to help others that may like be considering this, sure, or help those who've been through it that uh, need someone else to share. I think, and and I I think that um, my recruiter. I mean, I know recruiters a lot of times have a bad rap, but my recruiter gave me some good advice. He said, "Play the game," um, and a lot of it is it's it's a when you're in the military, you're not an individual. You have to be a team, and so give up. I mean, you don't have to give up your whole, you know, individ, uh, being an individual, but you are a team. Um, you may be a squad leader. You may be uh, um, with, with rank, obviously, as you get more rank, well, then you get more responsibility and you're in charge of people. Um, so you just have to remember that you're a team. Um, and probably the scariest, I don't know, the scariest is, is like I said, deploying when... With us being stateside, the, um, when I was activated, um, you know, it's, it's, did we do the right thing for the people? Did they get the training they needed? Um, we were able to, one of the things that the commander um, and I required is that every time a unit would deploy, we would be there as they get on the plane to shake their hand and say, you know, good luck. And um, with Iraqi Freedom, we were deployed for two years. So we actually got to see a lot of the units come back. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to shake their hands and say, mm -hmm. good to see you. Okay. Um, and, the, and then they could tell their stories about, you know, what, what they did in country. Um, initially, probably the scariest part is just, you know, wow, I'm in, uh, especially in Germany. Uh, I mean, it wasn't scary Germany. It was just your, you know, mil military person in um, and sometimes they would have alerts, um, and alert is all, it, and it was just a, um, an opportunity to um, practice what your job was. Uh, a lot of the military is once you get your training is, it's a job unless you're, de unless you're in a conflict or w unless you go to war. But, you know, pretty much it's just a day-to-day -day job. Um, but you wear a uniform, you, you know, you are required. You can't call in sick. You're supposed to go on sick call, things like that. Wait, you guys can call in sick? No, we can't. Oh, we can. <laughs> I was like, I didn't can't. know you could. Okay. No, no. Um, okay. That's, that's just it. Okay. Um, but it's, it's um, once again, it, it was, 
it was, it was very structured. So, I mean, it, it can be very structured because you have to, you know, certain, um, especially it, the type of job you may have. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, with the administrative um, field that I was in, well then, you know, it was, you went to the office. Mm -hmm. You spoke about your husband, and I know him in the community here, knows him in Chandler and Phoenix area, because I learned of him when I lived in the West Valley. Um, Michael Whitaker, which um, did pass away, but to have two individuals in the military, how did that work for you both? Because I don't, obviously, I, I, I don't remember what branch he was. So he was Air Force. He was Air Force. Yeah. How did that work? I've never met a couple that you had both of them. Well, it, it wasn't that difficult for us because me being in the reserves, I would... I wasn't, he was active duty, so he had, he was in the uniform every day. Mm -hmm. um, me being in the reserves, I would do it for the, the weekend or mm -hmm. when I was, when we did annual training, well, okay. then I would be in uniform. But typically, um, it, it wasn't difficult, you know, like I said, because me, active duty it would probably be difficult because, you know, you've got the, ar the army going this way and the air force going that way. Mm -hmm. But with the reserves, it was easier for me when Mike, um, yeah, you know, would get reassigned because we, we, um, in his, it, it, it was nice when he, when I met him and it's like, I, I can do the, the military thing. I get it. You know, I, you know, sure, let's get married and see the world. Well, I went to start, <laughs> once again, he got stationed at Shire Air Force Base right after we got married and, and he's, he traveled, but, um, and we stayed there eight years and he traveled a lot with his job. And, but I stayed there in South Carolina. Nothing against South Carolina, it's just that. I didn't see the world with him, he got to. Um, but um, it, it, was, um, it was easier for me being in the reserves and both of us being active duty and competing that way, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then when Mike retired, um, we came back to Arizona. And so I basically finished the rest of my military career um, here in Arizona, so I had a reserve unit, so a couple of reserve units, so yeah. Uh, I, being, uh, I, I think Mike and I were, um, we teased because he was Army, Air Force. I, the rivalry. Uh, yeah, I, I <laughs> um, my family was ASU, he went to U, U of A, um, you know, Democrat, Republican, all that <laughs> kind of thing, so it was, it, yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it wasn't difficult. We we took it. Yeah, he would dig the army, and I would dig the air force. So yeah, so it was all good. Good bantering. Exactly. Exactly. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, which brings me to what he did here that you get to participate in as well in the community. Um, Michael Whitaker, tell us more about him because he also is a veteran, but he's a he's he's passed away. Correct. Tell us a little bit more about Michael because he's just as important as you are. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Mike. Mike did 20 years um, in the Air Force, and so um, he was active duty. So he put the uniform on every single day, and um, then retired. Um, his, like I said, we were at Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina, and then um, came back to Arizona. His family was here in Arizona, and so was mine. So we came back to Arizona. Um, Mike got involved in the Exchange Club, and then eventually I got involved with Exchange Club too, and it's a service club, and one of the things that he um, got wind of, and I don't know for sure um, how he got the Reese Across America, but um, he had the idea, he got the idea, heard about the idea, heard about this, and um, brought it to the Exchange Club. Um, it was, and part of what exchange is all about is Americanism. So um, prevention of child abuse, Americanism, um, community service, and one more that I can't think of. Anyway, Americanism and, and the Reese Across America was just perfect. Um, he was able to, um, the one- The Field of Hope? Yes, the Field of Hope, mm -hmm. true. That's true. Um, you know, you know a lot too there. I'm very active Kingdom. in the community as exactly. far as volunteerism and patriotism. But yes, the, the Reese Across America was, was one of Mike's passions. Um, and we as, and then, and then it caught fire in the unit or in the, in the um, uh, community. 
in the community and also in the club. Oh. The club got really into it too. Also, Mike was a member of the Elks Lodge, and, and I um, was a um, um, semi semi um, um, active in the Elks Lodge. Um, but then when I retired from my civilian job too, well then I got more active in, in the Elks Lodge. And they too have a veterans committee, and so they also support the Reefs Across America. So there was a combination of things, how I got involved and Mike got involved. And then when he, um, and the, they had the, the, um, the cemetery here in Chandler, the Valley of the Sun. Mm -hmm. That's the one that they supported. The National Cemetery up by, by Cape Creek, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people do that, but um, the club wanted to do something in Chandler. Mm -hmm. So they were able to register the, the cemetery. And so each year um, they got a little bit more, a little bit more, it caught on. And then when Mike passed away um, in August, it was about that time that, um, the Reese Across America program was on the calendar, so you know it, it, it hit it so that um, started recruiting for sponsorships of the of the Reese and all that kind of stuff. So the family, the Whitaker family, decided once when Mike passed that, you know, this this was what he would want anyway. He he would want anybody as a, in lieu of flowers to to do Reese Across America. Absolutely. So. Um, and we actually, I say we today, the Chandler Business Alliance that I had mentioned as one of our sponsors today, once a month we do a spotlight on our nonprofit organizations that are selected and what they're doing in the community, and we raise monies. And today, um, your Michael's brother, Mark, did the presentation on Reads Across America, which we learned more about where it was founded, how it was founded, and it's like you said, it's not flowers, it's reeds, and the reeds are not Christmas reeds. He explained all the different area, parts of the rip of the, excuse me, the wreath that represent something on the wreath to give uh, recognition and remembrance of these veterans that have served. And like you mentioned a few minutes ago, the National Cemetery here in Phoenix um, is, is off of Cave Creek and um, I wanna say the, the 101. I lived in the West Valley and I have a nonprofit called Remember Me Always, and I donate, or excuse me, I purchase wreaths for the reason of remembering. And so I learned about the program over there. And then when I moved here to Chandler, I went to my first um, chamber breakfast, mm -hmm. and I met Michael, and his favorite saying is, oh. hola. <laughs> so I have to put that out there. It's humbling to say that. And I learned about it. I'm like, wait a minute, I know that program. So then I continue to do it here. And that program, actually, if you want, you can share this information right now so that we can get more individuals out there that probably don't know about this program to help us raise some more, make sure we have enough reads to go on the veterans' headstones on December 17th, I believe it is. That is correct, December so, 17th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the Reese Across America has, and they're all over the United States and also they are overseas too, mm -hmm. is that everybody has does the ceremony at the same time. Mm. There's, there's the laying of the wreaths, but there's also a, a memorial service. Mm -hmm. um, and so everyone's doing it at the same time. So we've got it going on. It actually started in, in Maine. Mm -hmm. so we've in got, 2007. Yeah, so the East Coast is doing their thing. And then, the, so everybody is doing the same. And um, there's also a script. So we're all basically doing the same program mm -hmm. all at the same time. Okay. And I say you do, you go to the, um, to the memorial service once and you're hooked and you'll always do it year after year. I've been doing it ever since. Exactly. And for anyone that wants to know that information as to how you can find more about Reads Across America and what cemeteries actually participate in this program so that you can be a part of it. Or as I was told this morning, get registered to actually be a part of, of this program is um, www.wreathsacrossamerica.org. And um, it's a great program. Um, the wreaths stay on for here. I don't know if it's the same in every cemetery, but for the one here, the wreaths stay at the cemetery on the headstones for exactly one week. And then you can come back and pick them up and pay it forward yeah. to either take them to other cemeteries where they don't have the role of taking them away or give them to somebody who could use a little exactly. bit of cheer. Exactly. Again, it's not a Christmas wreath. Correct. 
Right. So, right. Um, and on that website, they'll tell you how much it'll cost for how many reads. So now I have my final question. <laughs> I didn't prepare you for this no, one. You, you warned me that you were going to ask. <laughs> I did. I, don't I know did. Said. If I could only ask one question to learn about someone, it's this question. It's really easy because it's off the cuff. What message would you like to leave everyone based on your journey? Based on my journey? Um, take a chance. Um, mm. I, I think more and more... Um, you know, uh, if you think you can't do it, I think you can. Because pretty much, if someone else can do it, you can do it too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that um, take a chance. Um, live your dreams. Dream big. Mm -hmm. um, don't hold back. Um, it's going to be scary. Mm -hmm. um, I know, the, you know, just sometimes you, you find yourself going, how did I get into this? But in general, like this interview. <laughs> where, did I get, where did this come from? You know, kind of stuff. Because nobody wants to tell Christine no. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. But take a chance. Yeah. Okay. Just do it. Well, and taking a chance, like you said, is scary. And taking a chance is at anything. And, I, and from what I've learned in my walk is the thing that scares you the most is probably the thing you need to do. Exactly. Definitely. Exactly. Right? exactly. And if anything, you can say, Check that. I did that. <laughs> Please. I don't want to do it again, but I'll do it this time. I'll like jumping out of a perfectly yeah. good airplane. Right. You're like, well, okay, I did it, but I'm not doing it again. <laughs> exactly. 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 Thank you, Susan, for sharing your time. You bet, girl. And I definitely am glad that you um, didn't say no to me. We could, <laughs> we could share Michael's legacy as well as yours. And I want to thank you for your service and Michael's. And um, for those of you out there that are veterans. I don't think a lot of us realize what it is that you sacrifice, but I thank you as well and recognize you on this Veterans Day for sure. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to make sure is out there? Because we do have your contact information. That, um, in no, case. no. I, it, the military is not for everybody, but it's it's a good way of life. I, I, I agree uh, in, in regards to that. It was good for me um, and it took me into and there's lots of places that I wouldn't have gone to without the military. So mm -hmm. um, it was a good experience for me. Um, and um, I think, um, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. You didn't get to see as much of the world as Michael did, but you got to see some oh, of I, it. Oh, I bet I did. Yeah. I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But I, I got to see a lot. Um, and it, it um, um, just thank you. And um, it's, it's, yeah, nice. So I want to also have this as a mem memorial remembrance of our friend Michael Whitaker as well, who served in the Air Force. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you to my sponsors, Being My Studio, the Motivated Mind Group, located here down in downtown Chandler. I want to thank the Chandler Business Alliance, building the bridge between businesses and the nonprofit, and of course, the last but not forgotten, Cruise Planners. They help you see the world before you leave the world. If you have a story you want to share or a nonprofit making a difference in your community, please email me to the address of stories at christinehotchkiss.com. Until next time, everyone, I wish you well and you take care.